Welcome back to another worship service here at GCC. This time we're meeting virtually uh, simply because of the spread of the virus in our community and in our local church, and we want to keep you safe. And as disappointed as I am not to be face-to-face with you, I am still very excited to start a new series for the month of December called The Promises of Our God. You see it here next to me. The Promises of Our God. For three Sundays leading up to Christmas, we're going to consider some Old Testament prophecies that point to New Testament fulfillment in the gospel story of the birth of Jesus. And today, we will see that the next statement proves true. Christmas is proof of the promise-keeping power of our God. Christmas is proof of the promise-keeping power of the God we serve. I want you to hold on to that idea because this week and the next two weeks, we're going to consider the way that God redeems our past. In fact, that's what we'll look at today. God redeems our past. Next week, God steps into our present. He joins us in our present. And then the following week, just days before Christmas, God controls our futures. He has plans for us. So he redeems our past. He joins us in our present. And he has plans for our future. Those are all statements of good news. Those are all things that we should celebrate in the month of December. And today I want to begin that celebration considering the way that God redeems our past by looking at two Old Testament prophecies that point to fulfillment in the Gospel of Matthew. You'll see them here. The first one is Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. And the second is Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10. And those find their fulfillment in Matthew 2, 1 through 6, and Matthew 1, 1 through 3. That's what we're going to look at this morning together. Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 4. That's where we're going to begin. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth. The thought about the ends of the earth, that may come up again in a couple of weeks. But for now, I really want to focus on the immediacy of that prophecy in Micah. Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, invaded the promised land in 701 BC. This was a prophecy related to that event. It had immediate connections to what was happening in the prophet Micah's experience and the experiences of the people. It had political overtones. It was a reference to real struggles for justice and mercy. And yet, it was prophetically speaking of something to come even later in the future, something far off like most other prophecies under the old covenant. They pointed to something that would arrive with the new covenant, something better, something that applies in this case to the birthplace of Jesus, where the shepherd of God's flock and the leader of God's people to the ends of the earth, where he would arise. It would be Bethlehem Ephrathah, the city of Judah. And that's what we find in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that's the same city that we just read about in Micah 5, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The king was born in Bethlehem. Pay attention here. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And there you have it. Micah 5 quoted in Matthew chapter 2, a fulfillment 
proof that God redeems our past. But how do we know that? And what do we find in this story that builds the connection? It was God, to begin with, who ensured that this prophecy would come true. Mary and Joseph only ended up in Bethlehem because of a census taken by Caesar in Rome, something completely outside of their control. It's amazing to think that God's plan came together through his working behind the scenes. Consider your own life, how many times God is working behind the scenes in ways you'll never see, things you'll never really know, you may never know about, but God was working. I can tell you this, he is working in your life. Even if you don't see him, he's working. Even when it's behind the scenes, he's working to redeem your past. That's good news. I don't know what's going on in your life right now. I don't even get to physically see you today, but I know that God is with you. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows your burdens, your struggles, the things that you're facing, and he's working in the background. He's putting pieces together behind the scenes. He's planning something for your good, and he always keeps his promises. It's interesting to note Bethlehem was not the place we think of today, the birthplace of Jesus. At that point in time, The Bible says that they couldn't send a thousand soldiers to fight in battle. They couldn't even send a thousand soldiers. It was a tiny village, maybe just a few hundred people, nothing to brag about. So why Bethlehem? Why did God choose that place, a village in the land of Judea, a place that was small and seemingly useless and fruitless? And that's where this prophecy connects with real people. And you may already know some of these connections. Three people that we need to quickly consider connected to Bethlehem are King David, his ancestor Judah, and the woman he impregnates named Tamar. That's what we're going to spend our time looking at. They all appear in the genealogy of Jesus, our Lord, beginning with King David. So we know Bethlehem as the city of David. Before you realize that it's a city of Judah, the tribe of Judah, I'm sure you know Bethlehem was the city of David. It's quoted in the Gospels. We talk about it at Christmas time. This was where David was born, the great king of Israel. What do you know about King David, though? What do we really know about him? He's the youngest son of Jesse. He's an overlooked shepherd boy. So he's young. He's overlooked. He unexpectedly defeats Goliath. We know that story with a sling and smooth stones. This powerful enemy is overwhelmed through the strength of God at work in David. A great story. And that only leads to future victories. He proves to be a powerful military leader, an effective diplomat, and a poet laureate, bar none. He writes most of the Psalms. He sings and plays the lyre. He's a musician, an artist, on top of being a military leader and a great diplomat. He proves to be an awesome and well-rounded king with a beautiful track record on paper. We know all those things about King David, but no one would have expected those things from David, the youngest son of Jesse, the overlooked shepherd boy. But that's what God does. Already in the genealogy of Jesus, we see the beauty of God's plan unfolding, how he can redeem the past and change it forever. He displays his power in unexpected ways through unexpected people. People like me and you. Maybe... Maybe you feel overlooked. Maybe you feel misunderstood. Maybe you don't know where you fit in or what you have to offer. God has plans for you. He has gifts that he's placed in your life for you to use to do great things for his kingdom. In fact, the less likely you think you are to be used by God, it's probably the more likely you really are going to be used by God. David didn't expect much And he became the greatest king in Israel's history, apart from Jesus. What an awesome story. If the Bible teaches us one thing again and again and again, it's that you cannot underestimate God. Do not underestimate God. He always does more than we could ask or imagine. But even before King David and this story, we know a little more with a little more familiarity. There was another story of his ancestor, a man named Judah. Bethlehem was once called the city of Judah, long before David. 
And here's the connection to our other scripture this morning. Genesis chapter 49, beginning in verse 8. We'll just read a few verses. This is a prophecy that Jacob offers to his son, Judah. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. That's something every son wants to hear his father say on his deathbed. It's a powerful prophecy about the future of Judah and his kingdom. When we hear that Judah will hold the scepter forever, we may have imagined a different story than what we actually find unfolding in the book of Genesis. Judah doesn't seem to be the one who should hold the scepter between his feet forever as he rules over God's people. Let me remind you of the events we find in Genesis chapter 38 because the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 2 connects right back to another familiar story. Or for you, it may not be all that familiar, but it's about to be. Judah, who is with a woman named Tamar. Judah and Tamar. I'm going to call her Tamar because that's what everybody around here would call her. Judah and Tamar have an interesting interchange. One that's really not rated PG-13. It's an adults-only kind of story in the Bible. It involves prostitution. And that's because Tamar is married to Judah's oldest son, Ur. Ur fails to obey God, and he's punished by death. And so by leveret law, his next oldest brother would take his widow and impregnate her and give her a child so that she can carry on the older brother's name and have someone to take care of her. It was ancient Near East custom, especially for the Jewish people. And so Ur's next oldest brother, Onan, is supposed to impregnate this widow, Tamar. And so Tamar goes to Onan, and Onan, the Bible says, spills his seed in the dirt. He refuses to get this woman pregnant. He won't give her a child for whatever reasons he might have. He refuses to obey God's command. He leaves this widow childless and without help. It's really a a heartbreaking story. And so God takes his life as well. And now there's only one brother left, Judah's youngest son, Shelah. And Shelah is still a kid. And so Judah says, Tamar, just wait until Shelah grows up, and then I'll give him to you in marriage, and he can give you a child, and you'll carry on my oldest son's legacy. And she waits, and she waits. And when Shelah grows up, it says that Judah was afraid that he too would die, and so he kept him back from marriage to Tamar. He wouldn't allow him to be with this woman. And so Tamar, at her wit's end, knows that Judah's on his way somewhere, and she stops on the side of the road, dresses as a prostitute, and seduces her father-in-law to impregnate her. But he has no money to pay for this supposed prostitute. And so she says she needs a pledge, some kind of collateral, maybe his signet ring and his staff. And that's what she takes and his cord. And she holds on to these items and she finds out she is pregnant. And then her father-in-law finds out that her, that his daughter-in-law who has no husband is now pregnant. And he says, burn her for this treachery. She needs to die. And she says, wait, before you do, Let's find out who the father is. I have some of his personal belongings. And to Judah's chagrin, he's caught in a lie. And he realizes he's the father of this baby. And his response is to say, she is more righteous than I. Judah admits his fault. And Tamar does have a son. In fact, she has twin boys, Perez and Zerah. And Perez is a direct ancestor of Jesus our Lord the son of Judah and his widowed daughter-in-law, twice widowed and third time denied daughter-in-law, Tamar. A crazy story. And that all connects here in the gospel of Matthew 
chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now, Tamar didn't need to be mentioned, and yet she is. She's one of four women that Matthew makes mention of in the genealogy with great purpose. And Perez, the father of Hezron, and Hezron, the father of Ram. And so on, the genealogy continues. But what you need to notice is that Matthew goes out of his way to connect these dots, to say that Jesus is not just born in the city of David, but in the city of Judah and Tamar and Perez, this twisted triangle. Jesus is descended from people like that. What do these accounts teach us about God and his promises? Where are we going here? I think there's two extremely important points I want you to take away today. The first is this. We cannot earn God's favor because God doesn't play favorites. I'm going to try to make these catchy so you can remember. So the first one, we cannot earn God's favor because God doesn't play favorites. And the second one is like it. We cannot disappoint what God has appointed. We cannot disappoint what God has appointed. So the first one, God doesn't play favorites. God rarely chooses the person we would ever expect. Have you ever noticed that? And you read through the Bible, he never picks the person you think. David, the youngest son of Jesse, Judah, the third oldest of Jacob, and Tamar, not even an Israelite, a pagan woman. The apostle Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians. He says, for consider your calling, brothers, and we might add sisters, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what's weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. God redeems our past. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That's the first point. We cannot earn God's favor because God doesn't play favorites. You can't earn it. He loves you precisely because you seem unlovable. Isn't that awesome? And the second point now, we cannot disappoint what God has appointed. Judah and Tamar made some terrible choices, but it didn't stop God from using Judah as the ancestor of the true king of Israel. God made a promise and he kept his word. Judah's failure did not stop God. Nothing a man or woman ever does stops God or thwarts his sovereign plan for his people. Amen? Nothing we do can stop God's plan. Think about what that means for your life right now. God says he knows the end from the beginning. He has plans for you, plans for good for those who love him, to work all things together for good. And apart from forsaking Christ and blaspheming his Holy Spirit, there's nothing you're going to do that God can't forgive, that he won't forgive, that he hasn't sent his son to die to atone for. There's nothing you can do to ruin his plan. There's nothing you can do to stop him from loving you. It's an amazing thought. You might hurt yourself. Sin has consequences. Judah and Tamar felt consequences for what they did, but it didn't stop God's plan. Judah's promise was still received. His son His ancestor, Jesus Christ, would become the king of all kings because God's plan can't be stopped. You can't disappoint what God has appointed. The most amazing thing to note about David and Judah and Tamar's stories is that all three of these key players in Jesus' genealogy, all three of them are great sinners. They're all great sinners. Think about it. Judah sold his brother Joseph when they were younger as a slave And he later sleeps with a supposed prostitute, his own daughter-in-law. Tamar took justice into her own hands and seduced and deceived her own father-in-law. And David, of course, used his power to take advantage of a married woman named Bathsheba and then have her husband killed in battle. 
These are just the sins written down in the Bible for us to read and study. Who knows what else they did that God is aware of that we will never be aware of. One thing is for sure. These stories are scandalous. The things that Judah and Tamar and David did, people in Jesus' genealogy, these things were scandalous. These people sound awful. When you, when you recount these kind of stories, you don't respect Judah or Tamar or King David when you know some of the things they did. And yet they are names that hold respect in the church. They're names that continue to bear respect in the world. Why is that? I think it's time for some honesty. If each of our own personal stories were laid bare, our history, our past, I think we'd admit there are a lot of failures, a lot of embarrassing moments, a lot of things we would not be proud of. We've all proven unfaithful. We've all committed sins against God. We have all let him down. The Bible says none is righteous, not even one, not one of us has done the right thing. My past is full of struggles and disappointments. My life at times, if I'm really honest, has been scandalous. And yet there is a truth born in the genealogy of Jesus that sets us free. Scandalous sin requires scandalous grace and God has provided it. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus came to offer scandalous grace to cover our scandalous sin, to redeem our past. Everything about the story of Jesus is scandal. He himself never commits a sin, and yet his story is surrounded in scandal. His birth begins in an animal trough to a poor family in a nobody town that nobody respected. He grows older, and he breaks all the societal norms and conventions. He gains a lot of enemies. He helps the helpless. He serves the outcast. He trusts traitors and loves haters. And then he's murdered by his own people. The very ones he came to save, the people he loved, hated him. And just when they thought it was all over, he rose from the dead on the third day and shocked the whole world. Scandalous. That's why Judah and Tamar and King David and a host of other sinners are named in the genealogy of Jesus because Jesus came for sinners like them. Sinners like me and like you. He came for us. He came to rewrite our stories. He came to redeem our past. And my past needs redeeming. And I bet yours does too. Each one of you watching this right now, listening to my voice, you have, you have carried baggage around with you all your life. Sin and failure and frustration and weakness and doubts and fear and guilt and shame. We all carry the weight around with us. We carry it around every day. But the gospel, even in the genealogy of Jesus, at the very beginning in Matthew 1, the gospel already begs the question, what will you do with it? What will you do with it? It's amazing to think that the greatest king of all time, the son of God, was born to a family full of sinners in a poor village that had no room for his arrival. If Jesus could be born in a messed up family, in a crazy situation like that, I know he can come and be with me in my messed up life with my craziness. And he says he'll be with you too. He has come to redeem your past. That's the meaning of Christmas. That's the real meaning of Christmas, isn't it? That's what we celebrate all month of December. That's what we celebrate every day because that's the gospel scandalous grace for scandalous sinners like us. Have you received it? Have you received it? Give Jesus your baggage. Let him redeem your past. And may we who have ears to hear, listen to such a good word from our Lord. Amen.